Hey everybody, welcome back to another round of engineering. Yeah, let's keep going. So last week we were covering uh, a review of KCL and KVL, Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law. This week and next week, we're going to start working on new analysis techniques based off of, if you will, KVL and KCL. Okay? Now, the whole purpose of going into some of these alternative analysis techniques are that for given circuits, particular arrangements of circuits, it's sometimes better or easier, more time efficient to apply one of these alternative analysis techniques. Okay. Now, I will say that all of them end up being equivalent at the end of the day. If you have, for example, five unknowns, you're going to need five equations in order to solve the problem. And using KCL and KVL, that's how we generated those equations. Alternative analysis techniques will still require the same number of equations, but it will sometimes break it down into, say, two steps. You can solve a system of three equations and then turn around and do a couple of extra equations to get the other two. Okay. For example, it's really hard to kind of identify what's going on here until I give you the specific cases and we talk a little bit more about the analysis technique. But that's the general idea. All of these will get you to the same answer. Some of them very quickly. Other ones could take for a longer time. And so what we're going to do is as we go through the next four techniques, if I recall correctly, we'll start by anal analyzing the exact same circuit. That being said, I also wish I could tell you, oh, in this case, or, you know, give you a one size fits all for an analyzing circuits. That's just not the case. Some techniques work out a lot faster than others, and you have to kind of get a sense of um, experience, I guess, is the best way to say it. I myself don't have that experience as well. I will apply a technique that ends up being completely wrong for a given circuit. And I, by completely wrong, I mean it takes a whole lot longer to solve than if I had applied a different technique. That's just life. Okay. So the two that we're going to talk about this week are what we are referred to as node voltage and mesh current. It's not by accident that I've been trying to use this vocabulary already to get you familiarized with it. And when we say node voltage, what we mean are essential nodes, what I've been calling NE. Okay? And to remind you, an essential node is a, uh, if you will, a junction of, I'll say, three or more wires. Okay. So node voltage is a technique that depends on identifying the essential nodes. And we'll go through and talk about it a little bit more. This one takes advantage of, I'll say, KCL and I'll put plus Ohm's law. Okay. Alternatively, the second technique that we'll talk about this week is called the mesh current technique. And to remind you again, a mesh is the smallest possible loop in a circuit, or maybe a better way of saying it, it is a loop that does not contain any smaller loops. So I'll say a loop which does not contain smaller loop. Good so far? Okay. And the mesh current will actually take advantage of KVL plus Ohm's law. So it's almost like rather than applying KCL and KVL simultaneously on all five equations, we're just using one plus Ohm's law to do the circuit analysis. And then we'll have to do some back substitution to actually get our final answers. Okay, well, let's get at it here. And so we are going to talk about node voltage. Node 
voltage method. Voltage. Okay. Now, if we look at a circuit, okay, say, well, here, I'll, I'll draw this circuit that we will sit down and, and analyze. So I know that you know how to already go through this. In fact, I encourage you, go ahead and apply KCL and KVL to find the current in each of the branches. Okay. Go ahead and pause the video, go through and make sure that you have that idea. You know how to do that. Okay. Now, I think of, for example, node voltage. I think of that technique as rather than trying to find all of the currents in every branch in one go, rather what we're going to do is we are going to identify the different potentials in a circuit. So what that means is if you're thinking about potentials as being floors in a building, we're identifying where the ground floor is in the circuit. And then every node, we're identifying what the potential at each node is. Once we have the potential differences for every essential node in the circuit, then we'll apply Ohm's law to find the current between essential nodes. So that's kind of the 30,000 foot overview. So let me go ahead and give you kind of the algorithmic approach, the kind of process that you follow in order to apply the node voltage method. Number one, you have to identify the essential nodes. Okay? This whole technique is based off of the nodes. So you need to identify essential nodes. Nodes. In other words, we look at our circuit and we have to say, okay, well, there's a junction of three wires. And again, I encourage you label these. I'll call this one A and a junction of three more wires. I'll call that one B. And we notice that that's all of the essential nodes in our example circuit here. Okay. Number two. Okay. This one is really important. Okay, number two is what we are going to do is set one of our essential nodes as being the reference point. Okay. So I'll say set one node as reference point. Okay. What this means in practicality is that we're going to call one node grounded or we're going to set the potential at one of the nodes equal to zero volts. So we can say ground, I'll put grounded, or zero volts is what that means. And it doesn't matter where in the circuit we do this. Okay? We just, do, we ground one of them. Now, from a practical standpoint, we're thinking about equations. If we have NE essential nodes and we decide to ground one, how many more essential nodes do we need to find in, in terms of potential? NE minus one, right? If we ground one node, in other words, we know what the value is, then we only need NE minus one equations to find the potential of the remaining nodes, essential nodes. So that's the purpose of grounding one of them is that it reduces the number of equations that we need by one. Now for this example that we have here, um, let's go ahead and we'll ground node B as in boy. So I'll go ahead and I'll pretend that I ground B. Incidentally, the symbol, the circuit symbol for grounding tends to, I think it's either three wires or sometimes instead of seeing it drawn as three wires of decreasing size, you might also just see it drawn as a triangle. Okay. Either one of those just means grounded, zero potential. Okay. 
Now we have NE minus one essential nodes left to consider. So the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to consider a single node, essential node, excuse me, I keep swapping that terminology here. When I say node in these lectures, I mean an essential node. Okay, so if I forget to rem if I forget to correct myself at some point, essential node. We're talking essential nodes here. So consider a single essential node. Node. Okay. Consider an essential node, and we're going to apply apply KCL, if you will, KCL. Now the convention is that current is flowing out of the node. So we consider positive current to be flowing outwards from a given node and negative current to be going in to a node. And so I'll go ahead and let's go ahead and write our currents in here. I'll call this negative or this is I1 call this I2 and we'll call this I3 three oh excuse me um, I'll set this equal to a five volt source okay. and so when we write down KCL we're going to say I1 plus I2 plus I3 okay, equals zero and again, that's convention. The only time we put a negative sign in here is if we have something like a current supply that forces current into the node. Okay. Then we definitely know what direction it is. But otherwise, convention is that positive current is always going away from the node. The next step, step four, we are going to write I as some potential divided by R. In other words, we're going to apply Ohm's law. Okay. We want to write these currents in terms of a difference in potential between the nodes divided by any resistance along a given branch. And then lastly, number five will be solve solve for Vs, the potential at the nodes. Okay. Now in this case that I have drawn up here, we'll see that rather than having to solve three equations simultaneously, we'll only need to solve one. Okay. But after we solve that single equation, then we'll have to use Ohm's law to get the potent, or excuse me, to get the currents. Let's go ahead. I've drawn this up in another page. There we go. And so let's go ahead and go at it. 8 Ohm. We said, hey, we have I1 plus I2 plus I3. In other words, we are assuming that all of the currents excuse me, wrong button. We are assuming that all of the currents are flowing away from node A, I2, I3. So let's go ahead now and use Ohm's law to write these currents in terms of the potential at node A. So I'll start off I1 we have something like the potential at A minus the potential at B divided by eight. Except since we grounded node B, what's the potential? Zero. So I don't need to write VB here. I can just write, I'll write it explicitly. I'll put a zero in just to remind us that we had to take the difference between the two nodes. Go ahead, write down the other two. Yep. 
You got it? Pause the video if you don't have it yet. Okay, we'll go for it. So for current two, we need to find the difference between A and B. So we'll have node A. Then as we travel along, we notice we have this drop due to the potential supply. So I better put in five, right, the drop. And then of course we have node B. So for that second current, I should write something like this. The potential at A minus five. And the third current, yeah, you probably already got it, VA minus 10, put the minus zero in there, just for completeness over one. And that whole thing equals zero. Now let's look at this for a second. How many unknowns do I have? Just one, VA. So I don't even have to do any subs and solves anymore, right? I can just find the potential at A right away. So let's go ahead. We have VA, and I'll pull out that common term. We have 1 eighth plus 1 third plus 1. So that's taking into account the terms with VA in them. And I'll move the other terms to the other side. So I have something like 5 thirds plus 10. I'll write 10 as 30 thirds. Just I know I want a common denominator. Cool. Well, let's go ahead. We have VA. Let's see, 1 eighth is 3 24ths plus 8 24ths plus 24 24ths. And over on this side, we have 35 thirds. And we're home free. So we have something like VA is equal to well, 11 24. So this is interesting. We have 35 thirds times 24 30 fifths. Sorry, that four somehow got crossed there. It looked like a nine. In other words, Oh, goody, goody, the 35s cancel out. The 3 and the 24 have a common term. And I get something that says 8 volts. Pretty cool, huh? So instead of having to do three equations and subbing and solving, we only had one. The penalty is, is that we're not done yet. We have found the potential at node A. But if we want the currents... Now we have to use Ohm's law again. We have to go back and use VA in Ohm's law to find the individual currents. Okay, So that's what I mean by it makes it easier. It reduces the number of equations that you have to sub and solve simultaneously. But then it creates two-step process. Find the potential at A, then back substitute using Ohm's law to get the individual currents such as life. So let's go ahead. We have current one is simply VA divided by eight. So that one is just simply one amp. Remember one amp of current going away from node A. Well, how about the second one? We have I2 is equal to VA minus five over three. Yes, three. So I get something again that I2 is a positive one amp. Again, going away th from node A. And lastly, and you probably already see, I3, if these two are going away, you need to have something going in. 
So let's see if we actually get a negative number. We have VA minus, aha, here we go, 10 over 2. 1, excuse me, over 1. And so we get a negative 2 amps. I, I, it's magical to me, right? I mean, of course it has to balance, right? If you put two amps going out, there must be two amps going in. Notice the negative sign, so that flips the direction of I3, and order is restored. I don't know, it's always fascinating to me that this works, right? Like it just, I mean, I understand how it works, but it's still just, it's cool. So that's what happens, is that by finding the potential at the nodes, that makes uh, a system of equations, it gives you a fewer number of equations that you need to solve simultaneously. Okay. Cool. Well, let's go ahead. Let's work a harder problem here. Okay. So another problem. Let's go ahead, and I will go ahead and get this drawn up for you. There we go. I don't know why I was trying to redraw it. Just take a screenshot and throw it up there. That's a lot easier. <laughs> okay. So let's go ahead. Let us analyze the circuit to find the current through every single branch using the node voltage method. So go ahead. Take a minute. See if you can apply it. Go. You got it? Good. Okay, well, challenge accepted. Let's go at this. So uh, we notice that I've already got all four of our nodes, our essential nodes labeled A, B, C, and D as in dog. And I don't know if your choice will match with mine, but I'm gonna go ahead and, hmm, let's go ahead and ground essential node A. Now, I can't say that this will work every time, but generally, I, I would encourage you or suggest trying to ground the node that has the most wires going into it. So by that logic, I should be doing something like B or C. Okay. Generally, the node that has the most wires going into it, that'll be more advantageous to ground. Okay. I'm gonna do A for right now just because I mean, bottom of the figure, I guess, is probably the best thing. So, okay. Well, that being said, we have to apply KCL for three nodes, B, C, and D. So let's go ahead. So for B, oh, excuse me. Before we do that, let's go and label the current in each of these paths so that we're clear on which one we're talking about. So I will go ahead, I'm gonna call this one, I'll call that I1, I'll call this I2, two, I'll call this I3, three. So if I'm talking about B as in boy, I would have something that says I1 plus I2 plus I3, and then notice, because of this current source on this top branch, okay, because that is inherently away from the node, okay, I put a plus 5. Okay. Good? So let's go ahead and use Ohm's Law and write this in terms of the stuff that we do know. Notice I don't have to worry about applying Ohm's law here. For a current supply, I automatically know what the current is. So no Ohm's law needed. So let's see, this branch, what we have is the potential at B minus 40, and that whole rigmarole is over 12. And of course, you should have paused the video and already had this, but second one, we have VB. Notice there's no potential source between those two, so I just have VB over 25. 
And the third one plus, again, now here we have VB minus VC, right? The potential at B minus the potential at C over 20. And that whole rigmarole equals negative five. So I've just moved that to the other side. And boom, we're done with node B. There is one of my equations. Okay. Now, generally, when we apply the node voltage, as you start getting more and more familiar, you won't have to actually write down the currents or draw in the currents. You almost visually look at it, think of the currents flying off, and, and then do it that way. Okay. So uh, let's see here. So the next one. Okay, again, just so that we're clear on what we're talking about, I'll call this one, I th we already had that one labeled I3, I'll call this one I4, four. Okay. And again, notice convention is to always have the current going away from the node. Okay. So you see already a little bit of a difference with Kirchhoff's laws. In Kirchhoff's laws, you write down the currents and you keep those directions through the whole process. For node voltage, the convention is currents always flow away from the nodes. Okay. So even though we had current three flowing away from node B as in boy, we do the same thing for C, node C. We again say current three is moving in the opposite direction, away from node C. Okay. That's the convention. What ends up happening, and you'll see when we consider I3, is that you always write, well, okay, instead of VB minus VC, which I have highlighted, we'll have a term that says VC minus VB. In other words, those two potentials be switched. And so that the, the negative sign is baked in. One of those nodes, the current's flowing away from. The other one, the current will be flowing towards. And that negative sign will pop out because the two potentials have been switched. Okay. So in case you're worried about that, but wait, Greg, just a minute, what happened there? That's where the, that's where the convention takes care, or the algebra takes care of it. Okay. So let's go ahead. Let's consider node C. And what we have is we have I3 flowing out plus I4 flowing away. And here's where we have to be careful. Because we have a current source pushing current into node C, there's no ambiguity. We put a 5, a negative 5. So notice for node B as in boy, we put a plus. For C as in Charlie, we put a minus. Same thing, let's look at this point seven, the 7.5 amps. Again, it's pushing into node C, and so we have to have a negative sign. And we've taken care of all of our branches, so we'll put in zero here. Now we apply Ohm's law to get this in terms of the voltages. So we have voltage at C minus Bravo b over 20 plus charlie over 40 and that whole rigmarole equals 12.5 and so there is our second equation one more and okay, go ahead, do it for D as in uh, delta. You got it, right? You got it now? Okay, so we're dealing with this bottom node and you can think of the currents flowing away. Call this one I5. You can think of the currents flowing away. And so we have something for that node, D, as something like I5 plus I4. Notice again, the seven and a half 
current amp current source is going away from that node. So I can put a plus 7.5 here. Now let's go ahead and apply Ohm's law. And we have something like VD minus the potential at A. So we have a zero here all over 40 plus the potential at D minus the potential at C over 40. You see where the mistake is now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right here. All right, that's not VC. This is VC minus VD, right? Don't forget, okay? you always do the difference between two nodes. So when I considered this, when I was doing this path, right, I forgot that I wasn't going to ground. Okay? So be careful. That's a, that's a mistake I make a lot. I just, I get into my rhythm and I forget. Okay? So be careful. Okay, there we go. And then we have that whole rigor morale is equal to negative 7.5. And that's for D. Now look at this again, right? We have four essential nodes. We grounded one. And so we have three unknowns, the potential at B, C, and D. And now we have three equations, boom, highlight. And notice even furthermore, that these three equations are linear in the unknown variables meaning we can use our algebraic techniques to solve these equations, right? We can get the matrix, we can invert the matrix, and boom, out pops the answer. Try doing this with KCL and KVL. Right, how many, we'd have one, two, three, four, five. You'd have at least five equations that you'd have to sub and solve. So that's why I said sometimes node voltage will reduce the number of equations you have to solve simultaneously. Here's an example. Cool, huh? Well, let's go ahead and set up our matrix. Let's go ahead. I will, it's not very good efficient use of your time to watch me write down the, the, the stuff, but I'll at least do the first line, okay? So if I consider the first column as being the potential at B, the potential at C, the potential at D, and then the blah matrix, okay? So what do I have here? I have 1 12th plus 1 25th plus uh, da, 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 1 20th. For VC, you notice I have a minus 1 20th. For D, there is no D in there, so I have zero. And then if I'm thinking about my augmented matrix here, I have negative five plus 40 over 12. So I have a negative five plus 40 over 12. I guess we could have reduced that to something like what, 10 over three? Okay, boom, there's my first uh, row of my augmented matrix. Go ahead, fill out the other two rows. You got it? Good, 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 good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's do the second one. We have a negative 1 20th for B. And now you can see it's kind of hard to put the parentheses in and then, yeah, like, okay. Sometimes I, I struggle with getting my spacing. Uh, so we have uh, 1 over 20 plus 1 over 40. So we have 1 over 20 plus 1 over 40. So that takes care of this one and that one. And then we have a minus 1 over 40. And 
20, negative 20, 40, negative 40. And then that whole rigmarole equals 12.5. Third one? Yeah, you notice the third one doesn't deal with B at all, so we have zero here. That's always nice. And then what do we have? We have a, uh, for C, we have a negative one over 40 right here. And then for D, we have one over 40 plus one over 40. So we have a one over 20. And again, the whole thing is negative 7.5. Okay. So what do we get at the end of the day? We have our matrix here, boom, highlight. We need to invert it. I'll leave that to you. So what I have in my calculator for the potential at B, the potential at C, and the potential at D. What I have, let me try to be careful about my drawing here. I have something that says 40 for B, 172 for C, and negative 64 for D. If you're thinking about, if you're kind of thinking about these potentials as being different levels or floors on a building, you can see that D is actually below the ground floor. It's in the sub-basement, right? Whereas C is the top floor, the penthouse, and B is somewhere in between, right? A, ground floor, B is up a floor, C is the penthouse, D is the sub-basement. Now, the issue is, is that we're not done yet. You say, oh, okay, we're done. We still need, if we're after the currents, we still need to apply Ohm's law using these potentials to get final answers, right? Now, uh, we'll go ahead, let's do that. Okay, so let me go to a different page. Okay. So if we're looking we had something like, okay, well, the current through the 12 ohm resistor, that was given by VB minus 40 over 12. In other words, okay, well, we have a value for VB, 40. Oh, interesting, right? We have 40 minus 40 over 12. Well, interesting. There is no current flowing through that wire. Okay, curious. Okay, how about the current through, I'll call this the 12 ohm. How about the current through the 25 ohm resistor? Well, that was just VB over 25. And so we get 40 over 25, or if you prefer, uh, 8 fifths. Or is that 1.6 amps? Or the current through the 20 ohm resistor, the one that's between B and C. Well, that it doesn't matter which one we use. We could use VB minus VC over 20. Okay. equals, well, we have 40 minus 172 over 20. And so we see, okay, so this is 132, negative 132 over 20. And I guess we could probably reduce this down. Well, we should be able to reduce this down. Uh, so let's see, um, 65, 66. So negative 66 over 10. Okay, so that would be 30, negative 33 over 5. Or negative 6.6 .6 amps. Now I said it doesn't matter if you choose, you notice I chose the equation considering B 
as the node. And I got a negative number, meaning that the current is flowing into node B. If I had used the equation for node C, it would have been VC minus VB over 20, and I would have gotten positive 6.6 .6 amps. In other words, because I'm thinking about node C, it is flowing away from node C. So that's why I say it doesn't matter as long as you're consistent thinking of all of the current flowing away, then the algebra will protect you. If you choose node B, this, is, this equation has node B as the reference and it gets a negative sign, it's going into node B. This equation is using node C as the reference and it's flowing away, so you get a positive. So you're okay there, it doesn't matter which one you choose. Well, we have the 40 ohm resistor between, put 40, between A and D. So I'll put, I'll mention which one that is, excuse me, C and D. So I'll put 40 CD. And that one will put VC minus VD over 40. Oh boy, this is a big one, right? This is 172 minus a negative, so I get a positive 64 over 40. Excuse me, Wacom is just really sensitive today. Okay. So what is this? This is... Uh, 232, 236 divided by 40. Is this divided by 4? Uh, 20, you get 5, 59? Yeah. So you get 59 over 10, which is 5.9 amps. Okay. And again, notice that that's flowing down. Right, it's flowing from node C to node D. And lastly, we have the 40 between D and A. So we have VD over 40. And so we get something like negative 64 over 40. Uh, 64, so we get a 1, 24, 26, is that right? Uh, shoot, what was I thinking? Uh, no, 16, excuse me. <laughs> so we get a negative 16 over 10 or a negative 1.6 amps. So again, that means that it's flowing into D. Okay, so I've put this in here. And so now we can label everything if we want. So we said there's no current in this outside branch. VB, so we have 1.6 amps flowing into A. And notice we also have 1.6 amps flowing across this 40 ohm resistor in the bottom. And of course, there's zero flowing here, put zero. Okay. In fact, I'll, I'll label it and put it as zero just so that we remember that we haven't forgotten about that. Okay, so that takes care of that, 25. The 20 we have here, it's flowing this way, right? We have the negative sign and that's 6.6 .6 amps. Uh, we chose C, we have 5.9 amps flowing through this one. And there we go. Theoretically speaking, everything should match up now. If I look at a given node, for example, A, we see that it has 1.6 amps flowing in and 1.6 amps flowing out. Current is conserved. Same thing for D, what do we have here? We have 5.9 plus 1.6 
to 7.5 and then notice that we have 7.5 coming out. 7.5 plus 5 going in, 12.5. 6.6 plus 5.9, 12.5. So it still follows the current conservation, charge conservation if you want to. Sweet, huh? Okay. So I'll say mull that over, okay? See, you know, make sure that that makes sense. If you want more practice, take this figure that we have and go ahead, flip one of the sources and redo the analysis. If you wanna kind of get a feel for, you know, how this thing works, if you want more practice, okay? I think I'll leave it there for right now. This video has gotten long enough, but we'll keep working on some more example problems with node voltage in an upcoming video. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you next time.